Good afternoon. I am Dr. Indrajit Shardbad from Kolkata. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and really not a specialist in this field where epidemiologists and pulmonologists and medicine uh, persons, personnel really are the ones with the knowledge. But being an orthopedician and involved in whatever is going on under the COVID pandemic and being uh, influenced by it, I thought there were reasons which we could discuss what I mean as COVID clarifications. This is the virus which is causing the trouble. And you'd probably think that such a thing like this uh, wouldn't be enough. But make no mistake, this is a huge thing. And you can see on its surface, there is this red little spike proteins which are there. And these spike proteins give it the appearance of a crown or corona. And it's one of the group of coronaviruses. And this is the COVID-19 virus, which is the one which is causing all the trouble. So how are we fighting the pandemic in India? What's happened throughout? And it's important now to look at the chronology, because that's a very important word which came about. And the first information came on the 31st of December 2019, when China said they had a new disease in Wuhan, in which there was this mysterious virus which was infected, highly infected, was uh, affecting all sorts of people and all age groups. And the worst was there was no real medicine for it. And more important than that, it was killing people. So no one really had any idea, but China's uh, information came on the 31st of December. And then on the 7th of January, the government of India had a meeting and their first recommendations came on the 17th of January. And what they did was they uh, screened persons from China from 17th January. And the method that they used was thermal scanning, which was always done before. It was a very weak checking system where they looked at your temperature on your forehead or maybe on your wrist. And this was started in seven international airports in India. And people were very, very uh, aware of this thermal scanning and how to avoid it because many who had fever took paracetamol and artificially lowered their temperature. And they sailed through this thermal scanning and went into the city proper. Some who did not or were detected were put into uh, isolation. Some were put into home isolation, which no one really followed. And some went off into hospitals. And on the 30th of January, the first Indian coronavirus victim came, which is a student from Kerala who was studying at Wuhan and was brought back here. And from her, the genetic sequence was first mapped at Pune. So India became the only the fifth country in the world to have done that. And from the 31st of January, screening only for passengers from China and Hong Kong. And they detected only 39 cases, which were detected and sent to designated hospitals. But after that, in the whole of February, several events took place in India, which took our attention and took the attention of uh, whoever the persons were concerned or the government. Uh, and of them, then the 11th of February, the BJP was trounced in the Delhi election in spite of giving a massive uh, 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 people coming in from them to campaign. And then after that, when the government was sworn in, the Delhi riots started from the 23rd of February to the 1st of March, in which 200 people were injured and 53 were dead. And there was great chaos and everything was concentrated on that. And then on top of that, from February 23rd to 25th, Donald Trump visited India and practically the whole of India, excepting the rioting in Delhi, stopped. And there were lakhs of people congregated together at Ahmedabad. And it seems sort of ridiculous now that uh, there was uh, two lakh people could get together like that for this. But the same thermal scanning was started in all airports as late as from 5th March and expanded then to all countries after the Delhi riots had subsided. And then on the 9th of March, all outbound and inbound travels are banned. So, after China said on the 31st of December, two and a quarter months later, that all outbound and inbound travels were banned, and the result of which happened that about more than 15,000 people from foreign countries went into India all over. 
Maharashtra had its first case on the 9th of March. They now have 5,652 cases. So that's in one and a half months this has happened. Kerala, the first case on the 30th of January, but they have controlled it reasonably and now at 438. And Natak had 9th March had their first case, now at 443. UP now has 1,449 and West Bengal has 456. In March 11th, finally, WHO declared that this was a pandemic and the total cases now had gone up to 21,312 and on the 22nd of March, the government really got into action and they did a Janata curfew and, and on that day, all international flights were banned and the railways were banned from 4 a.m., making people locked down in their own place where they were and that included a lot of migrant workers who are working in a place away from home. There was lockdown for three weeks. The borders with Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal and Bhutan were finally sealed. On the 25th of March, financial package of 1,70,000 crores was given and people thought it was very less, only 0.8% of GDP, when the other countries were giving about 5%, 10%, 15% and even as high as 20%. And thousands of migrant workers attempted to start the long march home and the Home Minister ordered the states to stop them if required by paramilitary forces, which he would supply. And till date, many of these migrant workers are still stranded. Some have got away, but the majority still remain locked down in the place of their work. So this virus, let's have a further look at it and see what it is. This is basically called the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this is the one which causes the COVID-19 disease. It has only 29 proteins. That sequence is 29 proteins. And it is up against a whole human body of thousands of proteins of the human body, and you would have thought it was an unequal battle. But this is the battle where COVID was winning like mad. The interesting thing about this virus was that these virus cannot replicate by itself. It must enter a human cell to multiply. And then it tricks the human cell to copy their viral genomes. And they utilize this home cell to make their viral proteins. So first, it has to enter the cell. And this is how it goes in and enters the cell uh, over there. This is the virus uh, coming in and getting absorbed into the main cell. And then their proteins are going in and creating havoc. So, the first method of treating this would be stop the virus from getting into a cell. That makes sense. And we then found out that the lollipop shaped spike proteins is tip binds to a receptor cell called ACE2 found in some human cells. And these spikes, as we said before, gave a corona like appearance. So, it was a coronavirus. And some vaccines act on these spike proteins. Also, if there are antibodies which the body can create, or else if we give from outside, they can also hit there on these spike proteins. And we know that antibodies are present in plasma recovered patients, so they can be pooled or manufactured. And that is why pooled plasma is being tried and giving very good results in the treatment. Remember, it is hitting on these spike proteins and preventing the virus from getting into a cell. But then again, the mere attachment of the virus to the cell wall will not help. This spike protein has to be cut. And humans have an enzyme called furin, or the fancy name is the TMPR SS2. And this action can be stopped by hydroxychloroquine. And that is why hydroxychloroquine came an important uh, methodology in the preventive aspect of treatment of this virus. And there were many uh, persons who are in close touch or have to be in touch with the COVID patients they're giving hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic measure. But once this spike protein gets active, the virus fuses with the membrane, it injects its genomes into the cell and it is in and replicating furiously. So this to a human cell, this viral genome looks like any other RNA. And this RNA is the one which gives instructions for making new protein. So like a soldier with new orders, the human cell starts under this influence of this viral genome. It makes viral proteins and more viruses and more viruses and more viruses. Now this replication process can be targeted 
And one of the medicines used is remdesivine, an antiviral agent, which can target there and prevents the coughing. So this has been given fairly good trials, and this has been used, and it is very exciting and has given it's very good okay. results in the trial. Yes? Uh, that was just the computer saying, so please continue. So stop the virus from replication. So you know the spike proteins are there, the proteins are helping replications and accessory proteins in the virus itself, and you can stop it at all these points. The next problem appears, you have to stop the immune system from going haywire. Now anything, any infection, any of these viral infections causing an immune response. And this immune response is too much in these cases. This immune response not only can destroy the virus in its way, but the virus load is too much, so it can't destroy all of it. And then in the same process, this immune response destroys the normal human cells, especially the lungs. So early antivirals may help, but later on the immune systems take over and what an immune storm may happen. And this perversity can destroy the lungs, and this immune storm can happen in genetic disorders, patients and immunosuppressives, bone marrow transplants, etc., etc. So the drugs against this disease, in short, and there are many, many are experimental, many are being tried, but these are the ones which is uh, more or less being used. One is, of course, the oxyhydrochloroquine, more prophylactic, but remember, it should not be taken without medical supervision, and because it causes serious cardiac problems, apart from many other small steps, okay. preventing the thing from happening. Oh. The antivirals like remdesivir, that's another one, and anticoagulants are being given. In fact, uh, it has been found that uh, there are problems in the coagulation mechanism, so anticoagulants helps. Placenta extracts have come into the field, uh, especially from Israel, and it, that has been tried, very, very small uh, reports, but it is there. Now, Ivermectin was another medicine which came out. It's basically an anti-parasite, which has seen to lessen viral loads. And then interesting uh, reports came out that those countries given mass BCG have six times lower rates of COVID. And that uh, is what has happened in India. Uh, we were given mass BCG in our childhood, but the Western world discontinued BCG vaccinations in 2005. Mm -hmm and uh, look at what they are facing like. Now, this is all empirical. There's nothing really proven in it, but it's estimated that those countries have given, who are given mass BCG in their childhood have six times lower rates of COVID. So BCG and now another BCGW vaccines are being uh, advocated, but it is still uh, no fear, clear decision has been taken on this, but uh, hopefully this will be another way. The another thing is called decoy ACE2 receptors are being uh, given drugs which uh, actually have decoy ACE2 in the sense it tricks the virus to attaching uh, themselves to those ACE2 receptors, the decoy ones, and then destroying itself. And vaccines, so the first testing on humans started in Britain. Uh, that the test has really started today, I think. And the general feeling, it will take about a year for it to come about, but they say uh, what's happened, the Britishers have said that they have, uh, the companies have really uh, invested money on the manufacturing of it before even the trials have concluded. It's a big risk because if the trials are wrong, uh, and then, they, then all this investment that they're doing uh, would go uh, to waste. But anyway, this is it, and they hope that it can be out by September, October for uh, manufacturing. So the renewal of the lockdown has now gone on to the 3rd May. Hotspots have been identified, about 170 All India and all the major cities are there. And these are divided into red, orange and green. And relaxations were in the green zone from the 20th. And it was felt that the half of India is disease-free. The rest of the half is still uh, under the, under the uh, scope of this disease. So, so just a question regarding the vaccine which is being put on human trial today in Britain. Uh, are the vaccine already being manufactured, uh, like mass production has started? Yes, yes. Ideally, the whole system goes like this, that the vaccine undergoes trial, then it goes for mass production. But due to the urgency of the situation, the mass production has started uh, on the anticipation that these trials are going to be okay. Now, if these trials are not okay, that investment on this mass production will be gone to waste. 
but that's a risk which has been taken. There's an Indian company which has taken that risk, hoping that uh, it, the trials will succeed and they will be the first ones to get it to India uh, quickly. And that's an admirable thing, but it's a risky thing, but it's been a conscious risk. So the testing, the main important part is the testing part of it. So due to limited testing as of March 2020, no countries had reliable data on the prevalence of the virus in their population. And this was very strange because the virus was in there and China had some. There's a Wuhan laboratory were promptly followed by Wuhan labs in Shenzhen, Tianjin, Beijing and Shanghai. So in a total of 12 cities across China and by the 4th of March 2020, the Chinese uh, were testing 50,000 tests per day. India started testing uh, later on and we go on to what are the tests which are there. So the testing per million in India is only 66, but see US is 5,000, 2,000, uh, 2, uh, 5,027, 11,448 for Italy and 29,591 for Bahrain, and Bahrain is such a small place at all. So India is 66, but requires to ramp it, ramp it up hugely in the times to come. So uh, a question regarding uh, the data, the testing data that is being generated in India, if there is such a poor uh, ratio of people being tested per million, uh, does the data really tell us something about the progress of the virus uh, in our country or is it just a... Uh, it, 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 it's an indication in the sense that uh, kits were not that, uh, it was expensive. The PCR test was being done. Uh, kits were expensive, were not available. So they had to be very selective in testing whom uh, the persons would be. So they were testing symptomatic patients. They were testing patients who came in from foreign countries and those who were in the immediate vicinity of these positive tests. So later on, they have now gone on to identifying hotspots. And once they've identified hotspots means uh, where the uh, number of positive cases have reached a certain level. And so they are testing now in all over that area of that hotspot. Actually, actually what they are doing is when they are testing them, when they have found a symptomatic patient, they're asking them for their travel history. Usually this uh, virus would be a manifest within seven to 10 days. So that's about much as they would, they would go back in the travel history. Uh, how are they determining uh, which foreign national or tourist that is coming into India uh, to ask them questions? Like, is it like pre-January, they are also screening pre-January tourists or foreign nationals who have entered the country or is it only from February? They uh, have the data of the persons who came in from outside and they were testing them by the thermal scanning. But what, let's say it's in, uh, say in March, someone has got uh, infected. He's having all the fever uh, things and they test him and they find he's positive. So in that case, they will ask for his travel history and that travel history will probably go back to at least two weeks, if not more, slightly more, say three weeks, because by that time, the, uh, the uh, symptoms would have been obvious. Now, there are many asymptomatic patients in which the travel history has to go further back. And that's what they're doing now, looking at the travel history in a more detailed manner. It, it was not really done to that extent earlier where they extent of the asymptomatic diseases were not really realized. So now that they are knowing that the asymptomatic patients are huge in number, they are going back in the travel history. Uh, but does it uh, really matter now since the asymptomatic patients has probably now transmitted the virus to probably thousands that they have come in contact? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so they will trace the contact. Now, if they had a uh, foreign uh, history, say, six weeks back, they're now going to go back to that person and ask him the, for the six weeks, who were the persons you were in contact with. But is, so is, is it really possible for a person, an asymptomatic patient, for himself or herself to realize that they're sick and they would be monitoring as how many patients they came in contact with? So, uh, I would agree that it is difficult, but at least he will be able to identify out of say, 100 patients, 100 persons he's uh, gone with, uh, he will be able to identify about 30 or 40. And even that is a benefit because then the test will be done on those 30 and 40. So the interesting thing which I wanted to point out that India has lower positive tests. In the year, if you have confirmed tests per 100 tested, if you make 100 tests, the UK has 22 positive cases, 22 out of 100. India has four. South Korea has two and Taiwan, a very small place, has one. 
So this uh, test was uh, based upon uh, uh, patients who had who displayed symptoms. This didn't cover asymptomatic patients, right? Now that they are testing for also the persons who have come into contact with those who have come from foreign places, yes. or else symptomatic patients and their contacts. Yes. So they are asymptomatic also. So, but that that has only started only three to four days back. Uh, slightly, slightly more than that. Probably uh, uh, from the beginning of this month. From the beginning of this month, uh, and the UK has been testing uh, since when asymptomatic patients. Asymptomatic patients, UK has not been testing in that uh, positive way, but uh, people realize that the asymptomatic patients were huge. It's only from the end of March, beginning of April. Previously, it was only the symptomatic patients who were being uh, really looked at. So now we come to the types of testing. And the main uh, is the RT-PCR. RT-PCR means reverse transcription. That's a very a polymerase chain reaction uh, test, uh, PCR. And you can see them that you take the nasal swab and you take the uh, throat swab and you uh, get it done uh, into the lab. Now, this is a time-consuming process. It takes about uh, two to three days to get a result. And even then, there are a lot of uh, uh, minus points in it that the swabs that are taken has to be transported properly. The swabs have to be taken properly. The swab sticks and all have to be done. There are two swabs per test tube. And interesting thing is that it is only reliable in the first week of the disease. If the disease has spread more, say he had been symptomatic for more than seven days, then you need to do a sputum test. Like you have to pop and take the sputum out and then test it. Or else you have to do something like a bronchial lavage where you have to put a tube down the uh, nose to the uh, lung, uh, to the passageway, to the bronchus, and then take out samples from there and test it. So it has to be that this has to be tested in the first week of the disease. Uh, RT-PCR tests, have we started uh, these tests in India? Yes, this was the only test that we were doing. We didn't know of anything else right from the day when the positive tests were being done. So that was being started from January uh, or February first week onwards. And now this is, uh, the kits are more available. Uh, they are being done in a lot of uh, places. Uh, previously, it was only being done in some government uh, labs. ICMR labs and they went for the uh, private labs and now it's being got it. Calcutta has, uh, uh, I think, seven government places and about equal number of private places and they're, and it's expanding. It's expanding the places where it can be done. The next was the, came the antibody test in which we knew from the end of uh, March, beginning of April, that the antibody test was a quick test. It was a cheaper test. So what, what was done, the blood was taken and then tested for antibody to this virus. Now, if it was negative, it didn't mean anything. But if it was positive, it meant that the patient had some sort of infection or has been exposed to that infection before. So does now the one antibody specifically, antibody test, does it specifically say that the antibody generated is for the COVID virus? No, no. Because the major problem is that if you had had a flu shot before, uh, the many uh, it's not prevalent very much in India, but in the rest of the world, a flu shot is always there. And if you have had a flu uh, shot, then this may be positive in the antibody test. So it's this, this, more effective in India, is it? Yeah. It, it, to it, determine it, that uh, it's, it's a COVID uh, virus. Yeah. It, mainly because, uh, because it's a quick test. But, but a rapid the person uh, is, is uh, infected by another uh, uh, influenza virus and there are so many uh, that we are affected by in India. Uh, the antibody, is there any way of uh, this antibody test to determine that the antibody that is there is specifically being generated for COVID? No, this is a broad-based test. This is a broad-based test. It just determines whether uh, some of these antibodies have been created in the body or not. And it is assumed, therefore, that uh, those who have positive antibody tests are the ones uh, who have been exposed to this virus before, provided he hasn't taken one of those uh, pneumococcal vaccines. Either. 
but uh, but but on the basis of this antibody test uh, uh, where you you cannot really determine whether a patient oh. is covid in uh, the government is the government is uh, isolating or uh, the patient right uh, groups of patients together taking them as covid infected and maybe some of the patients are covid infected and some are not but they all be all they are, they are all being isolated together say i am uh, uh, sick of a non uh, covid 19 uh, virus and another yeah. person is but we are both being put together in an isolation ward uh, and essentially we are sharing the same air and the same uh, space with a covid patient though we may be not infected with the covid virus is that right yeah it comes about that if there is an antibody test positive and the patient is asymptomatic they are being put into home quarantine and if an antibody test is positive then the next thing would be immediately to go in for the pcr test and the pcr test is a clincher so if there is antibody test positive and a pcr test positive that proves he is a covid patient and he will go into the have party. any idea of uh, number of antibody tests uh, is it is it like this that after every antibody test a pcr test is being done no 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 it's only the positive test those who are antibody tested positive which gives an indication that he probably may have had a infection of the covid virus those are the ones which are being tested now due to the scarcity of the uh, pcr uh, kits so that's why this has given a good idea to test only those who are antibody positive and more effective use of the scarce uh, uh, rt pcr kits so there were reports of the rt pcr test uh, that there were inconclusive results being shown on the rt pcr because of the non standardization of different uh, test kits of various manufacturing companies so uh, It depends on the test kits. Now, if the test kits are not uh, well done, or if there are batches of this which is not well done, now the RT-PCR also, and mainly of the antibody test. The antibody test has really been uh, a bit of a disappointment in that that a lot of the these kits that were used for the antibody test has proved to be uh, not good. So, so say say I am a patient and I have a like a symptom, say a viral flu symptom, and an antibody test is done on me. and then after that rt pcr is test is done on me but uh, say it shows up a false positive or a false negative so either ways i'm released maybe i'm a covid patient and i'm released or maybe i'm not a covid patient and i'm put into an isolation ward where i have to share uh, the same space with other covid patients and this has uh, probably happened because the test kits were defective is there a possibility that this happened actually if there is an antibody test positive and a pcr test positive that gives a fair indication that you are a covid patient but since we are arguing here that the test kits itself were not showing or was or was showing false positives or false negatives that is, that is true but you have an antibody test which is negative which is failed whatever the reason the test kit or whatever or you are not infected and you also have this pcr test which is also negative so two cases uh, uh, in which it is negative it means that if you are symptomatic you have to be go into isolation there is no question about it this isolation may be a home isolation and if the symptoms in, uh, get worse you have to hospitalized and if the symptoms get away and the majority of the symptoms really go down with simple medicines in fact uh, the death rate is only about 3 to 4% so majority of the people was going to get better but it's a very gruesome experience because uh, having that respiratory distress and all but why do these patients have respiratory distress and one of the other things that was done was the ct chest and you can see on the ct chest this is a lung thing and you can see what happens when there is covid these are the areas in which the whole lung is being affected and now once this lung is being affected what happens is the lung expands but somehow or the other the oxygen exchange does not take place so there are patients who are on ventilators now in which case they have been given 100% oxygen but their blood oxygen saturation is only 70 75 80% which means that they are breathing in 100% oxygen but their blood oxygen levels are low 
So this is what happens, and this is one of the diagnostic methods in which you see this uh, uh, CT scan. You see this. You have to uh, almost sure that this is a COVID patient. Together with that, there are other tests like the uh, the standard ones which we all do: uh, ESR, blood coagulation test, CRP, etc. But these are the three main ones in which uh, has to be done. So what happens in the antibody test is that after infection, a thing is called immunoglobulin, Ig, that IgM and IgG both rises. After seven to eight days of infection, IgM is present. So you test at eight days, and if IgM is present, you get an antibody positive. And then you test again at twenty-one days, and then the IgG also becomes positive. So basically, this antibody test you can test at eight days again at twenty-one days because it's Uh, cheaper is seven hundred, eight hundred rupees, and it's just a blood test. Remember, but that the antibody test does not diagnose COVID, but only the body responds to it. It is to be used only for mass screening. Now, using it for a mass screening, what is happening? So now has come the pooled test. So what they are doing in the pooled test? You take have a hundred persons, you make them into five groups of twenty each. So you do twenty tests. So the five persons, you take the blood and mix it together, and then you test it. So you are doing twenty groups, that is twenty tests, each of five. So out of the twenty tests, two become positive. So go back to those two groups, that is ten persons. So then you do a ten time ten tests now, the PCR, three are positive. So total test for this group is then only thirty, and the three positive is tested by PCR. So total of thirty three instead of doing a hundred tests. So that is a one third diminution in it, but the problem, as you said, and which has become such a problem, is the faulty kits, and the faulty kits, uh, unfortunately, have all been identified with China. There are many other tests. Uh, the FDA has approved a test called the uh, isothermal nucleic acid amplification instead of the PCR. So this result can come in a little at five minutes, and negative results in thirteen minutes. And may be manufactured at a rate of fifty thousand units per day soon. So this is another uh, exciting thing. And the last one that you write to see the unusual name of Peluda. And we all know from uh, Calcutta and Bengal that Peluda is the legendary detective created by Shottajit Roy. And uh, this test that is done was uh, Shovik Maithi and Devachuti Chakravarti at the Council of uh, CSIS Institute of Genomics and Integrated Biology at New Delhi. It's a strip test. So what they do is basically they identify the genetic, the genomic sequence of the coronavirus, and then they test it by paper strip, you know, uh, like a pregnancy strip. And the whole thing is only about five hundred rupees. And immediately you can know that whether the patient is COVID positive or not. And this has uh, probably coming into the market very soon. Uh, I think within this month. So that can be a huge boost. Uh, to the diagnosis, the quick diagnosis of uh, this COVID uh, individuals. So this test, uh, it is equally effective at say uh, during the early phases of the infection as well as later phases. Yes, yes, it is. It is. It is very, uh, very effective. And if uh, if you have a COVID infection, uh, it can be identified. That's why it is so exciting. It covers asymptomatic patients as well. Yes, it will cover that if you are COVID positive or not. They'll tell you because that because they are getting the sequence there. The symptoms are uh, social distancing, and now everybody is talking about social distancing and how it works and how it goes, etc. And it is uh, important that if you look at this chart, uh, you see on the left hand side there is no reduction in social contact. So one person infects say two and a half persons, and this two and a half person can infect after thirty days four hundred and six people. But if you do social distancing, say one person goes to one and a half persons, and one and a half persons will infect only fifty. So after thirty days, four hundred and six and fifty. And this is that's why it is so 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 important to do social distancing. And now uh, the problem is that social distancing is very difficult to achieve. So that is why the law enforcement authorities have to come in, the police have to come in, and. Uh, You can see day by day that the uh, the common man is not understanding this social distancing, and you find very educated persons also saying that oh, go out for fifteen minutes, 
a going out for 10 12 minutes is not going to happen oh not at all this can happen any moment so you keep yourself away from the person it was usually a full handspread distance now they are saying almost 2 uh, meters 2 and a half meters distance and when we are in the clinics we are trying to keep all our patients at this distance and maintaining this social distancing one of the problems that we are facing is that if you are operating then all your assistants and all are around you so it's very difficult to maintain the social distancing is something which we have to work out uh, which we are doing so with the ppe kit but that's another story a lot of the key uh, epidemiologists in india the, there are two uh, different schools of thought one is supporting social distancing and the other is saying that we should now think about how to go about herd immunity in this country because social distancing uh, say uh, in a 50000 uh, uh, populated slum uh, which has a plastic sheet as a barrier wall between two uh, families is practically uh, is social distancing cannot be applied there i i i agree i agree with you it's practically not possible for everybody and uh, that's, but that's basically for majority of india uh, social distancing is a distant reality uh maybe only in a, in in, a, in housing complexes or for people who have uh say who are staying in flats or staying in a pakka house it 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 may be so that for a certain period of time that social distancing is protecting them but the moment they have to go out say into the local markets to buy uh produce to, in order to eat and survive they are exposing themselves because uh architecturally in our country the roads the alleyways the the even uh, the distance inside uh, work spaces and office buildings has never been thought to include a 6 feet distance uh, in between people for such a populous country like india so how effective really is social distancing and uh, what uh, is the alternative and somehow it's been suggested that herd immunity is but is it is herd immunity also a realistic proposition for our country I, i will be dealing with herd immunity uh, shortly but as you are saying uh, there is a practical problem in maintaining social distancing in slum areas or in places where there is not the space enough for all the family members to stay or simply on roads when you are going out to do bazaar yes so that's why all those circles were being drawn and keeping the distance wise and all that so at least uh, some some way some little thing can be done in that but generally speaking that's why the rail uh, rail travel has been stopped the general buses and all travel has been stopped uh, air, air flights have been stopped is due to that is to prevent uh, this uh, uh, this close contact with uh, patients uh, with persons in between themselves uh, i will deal with that a little bit later but at the other time apart from social distancing is a uh, washing of the hands a washing of the hands means that you do it with a soap and the soap brings a uh, dissolves the uh, fat layer of the viruses and uh, sort of kills it so before during and after before eating food before and after caring for someone at home before and after treating a cut or wound after using the toilet after changing diapers and especially after blowing your nose coughing or sneezing that's extremely important because you all know about the way you have to cough uh, the way you have to blow your nose a uh, way of sneezing that into the Uh, a, a, into the angle of the uh, ar- arms, etc. So after touching an animal, animal feed animal waste. Though we are almost sure that it not uh, animals are not infected by it, but now some reports are coming up that uh, dogs and cats and tigers have been infected. So after handling pet food or pet treats, uh, not necessary at this, but definitely after touching garbage. So these are the areas in which you have to wash hands, and the way you have to wash hands has been demonstrated many times. And to wash your hands for twenty seconds. Uh, in between the fingers, underneath the nails, on the front and back, on the wrists and all, and then uh, you wash it for 20 seconds, uh, like uh, so. That's it. You wet your hands first. Uh, turn off the tap and apply soap. Lather your hands. Lather the back of your hands, uh, fingers, under your nails. Scrub your hands for these 20 seconds, and uh, you can hum the happy birthday song from. Uh, I would say if you can sing the national anthem, that's uh, half of it. That will be 20 seconds. So rinse your hands well under it, and then dry your hands using a towel or better still air dry. So that's the way you wash your hands. But wash your hands frequently. Uh, the use of the sanitizer is a bit of a problem 
Sanitizers can reduce the number of uh, germs on the hand in many situations, but they do not get rid of all types of germs. So you use a sanitizer, make sure that it has about 70% al isopropyl alcohol. So hand sanitizers might not remove heavy, harmful chemicals. Uh, so you apply it, rub your hands together, rub the gel all over the surface of your hands, and then dry for about 20 seconds. So that is an, a good example, but preferably wash your hands. So what, what, makes, what makes soaps, a use, of, use of soap more effective than a hand sanitizer? What different the soap has a, has a compound which dissolves the outer lipid layer of the virus and therefore kills it. So that is why it is so important to soap. Okay, and the sanitizer acts in which uh, way? In a similar way? In a? Does the hand sanitizer act in a similar way? Like soap? It acts in, it, it, almost like soap, uh, it acts in a similar way. But if your hands are initially greasy or visibly dirty, then it's not going to be that effective. So uh, basically what happens is that uh, you majority of the time you use the soap and the other times when you're very quickly going somewhere or coming somewhere or okay, getting into a room, you can use the sanitizer to do the job. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, preferably the soap. The other thing is that uh, many, many uh, economists, many social scientists have said that how many persons have running water in their homes. If you're going to wash your hands, how many persons are running water? And that is another issue. But then someone has to pour the water into the hands, etc. And uh, you have to go at it that way. There are problems in our country. There are problems. But whatever little we do, or the most of it, if most of us stick to certain plans, then definitely uh, there will be uh, the, uh, uh, the infection will lessen. So what better measures can be taken? after this. So tests have to be made easier and the tests as we discussed it have to be uh, better. The antibody kits have to be standardized, no question about it. You can't have false uh, kits going around and uh, uh, worse uh, getting false results. So the PPE kits or the personal protection equipment kits have to be more and more and more. And that is nobody, no medical worker, uh, be it the staff, be it the nurses, be it the doctors, should not have a problem with the PPE wear. Now, the strict adherence to the PPE wear is necessary. It is not easy wearing a PPE wear. So, those not treating COVID patients directly, as in clinics, uh, like what we are seeing here, uh, we are wearing these sort of uh, gowns, the, the masks, or this is the N95 mask. Uh, this cap is a simple one. You can wear two caps, you can wear a bigger cap. But as matters in the clinics, the results. Uh, maintaining social distance of the patient, uh, maintaining, telling the patients to wear gloves, uh, telling them to wear masks, giving them a sanitizer, etc. All of this uh, helps a lot. How, how is the cap helping you from, uh, how is the cap protecting you from a COVID infection? Yes, to any surface it can find. It adheres more to the metallic surfaces, lesser to the other surfaces, but even to your scalp, the virus can be there. So it's on the presumption that uh, a doctor or a person touches his hair and later touches the mouth and gets infected. It's estimated that a person uh, touches his nose about 90 times. So that's the mask has a, has a uh, one advantage of the mask is that it prevents you from touching your nose. Uh, then the, we were wearing spectacles because we had spectacles, but there are goggles now which are very much uh, goes all the way around and uh, cuts off the virus access to the eyes. So that is another and another. From the sides. Nowadays, what we are using is maybe uh, wearing the N95, uh, using a mask also over it, so meaning a double protection to that whole thing. All right. And over the see, we are using a plastic thing, a disposable thing on it. And once after examining a patient, we take off the, we put the sanitize that plastic stuff, and then we take off the plastic and throw it away, leaving the latex glove in here and then putting another uh, plastic on top of it for the next patient. So all this uh, helps uh, as much as possible, but the risks are there and uh, doctors getting infected by seeing patients is not unusual. A lot of, uh, a lot of mortalities have also taken place. A lot of virus uh, infect by getting into the ear, through the ear? Uh, 
any orifice would be there. All it needs is a cell to go in. But majority of the time, it goes in through the mouth, nose, and eyes. These are the main, plus the hands, through the hands to the same places. But mainly, it's an upper respiratory tract thing. So, it, it, it infects the ear. Uh, uh, is, it, is that a possibility? Extremely unlikely for the ear as such, because the ear has a passageway which is uh, not very uh, simple. So okay. now, if you put your uh, hand on an uh, infected virus thing and then you dig into your ears uh, all the time, I think the virus can go in there, but it's unlikely to uh -huh. cause problem. The more, the more easier and the more quicker way would be through the mouth and nose. So, uh, let's go on to the next one. What is the plight of the doctors? And this is a problem which, uh, you see, you can tell that the doctors are the warriors and they are the warriors and this and that and all that stuff. Uh, but basically, the doctors are pushed into the front line here. And it is a big problem, big, big problem. So, the PPE kits have to be there. Only the N95 masks, nothing less than that. Face shield has to be used, especially while doing an operation, because the face shield will prevent the splattering on the eyes and uh, the nose or the skin or the cheek. And hoods have to be worn. That's the one we are discussing, the hoods to cover the head also. The second uh, thing is duty hours. Those doing COVID or isolation duty cannot go to general ward that day. That has to be strictly enforced. They go into this ward and then they go home or whatever, or they go back to their uh, quarters and come back again and do, say, seven days of isolation duty. That is possible. But they cannot go to the general ward at the same time. The third question is of transport. Now, the transport of the doctors and the medical staff is another problem. Because inside the bus or inside whatever the car or whatever, again, they have to try and maintain the social distance and stay. Now, the whole thinking has been to make the doctors on duty stay inside the hospital complex so that they don't go out, they don't expose their families, they don't expose any others. Because one of the most dangerous things that happen if a doctor is infected, he can infect thousands of, uh, actually thousands, uh, majority of hundreds of patients at least. Uh, examining them or uh, in the clinic or operating them. Now, the below 60 years is another problem, though there are some uh, theories in the US that uh, uh, 16 to 49, uh, 50 group is also being affected. But basically, below 60 years have a better chance. That's what statistics says of survival. Over the 60, they're likely to have comorbidities and uh, it is uh, recommended that they are not put into the front line. Uh, insurance. Everybody of the government is now saying about insurance. Someone is giving 10 lakhs, someone is giving 5 lakhs, someone is giving 50 lakhs, etc., etc. Now, insurance is fine, but you must remember that the doctor has to die before he gets the insurance. And uh, that is the bottom line of it. The disposal of equipment, you see the PPE and all these are uh, polythene, these are uh, in a way a plastic thing. So these has to be disposed properly. Now, we had uh, banned, you know, uh, the single plastic uh, for, uh, earlier on, before the COVID came. So the disposal of the equipment has to be thoroughly done. Where do you shed your equipment? What is the, after that you shed your equipment? How is it being disposed of? It is not to be thrown on the roads. It is not to be thrown anywhere. This has to be disposed of properly. And the system must be there. Doctors and uh, paramedical staff, uh, all these people, uh, there, the nurses and the paramedical staff must have frequent tests because you're testing them one day, then they go into the ward again, they get in reinfected again. So, they must have frequent tests because if these people are infected, not only is it a problem to themselves and their families, but it's also a problem to all other patients and it's a problem to all their colleagues also. The next thing of the plight of doctors is death. You must have read those horror stories going around that a person is not being allowed a decent. Uh, way of being cremated or buried. And the people uh, uh, who don't want them to be cremated or buried near their uh, houses, I understand the problems of the fear that they have. But the fact is that every, the doctor especially or the uh, health staff person, even in death, they deserve to be treated with dignity. And that is something which has to be looked at by the governments. I believe the, law the government of India has enacted the Epidemic and Diseases Act, which 
is now put to protect doctors and healthcare professionals uh, by the problem, is, the problem is that 19 states already had similar laws but in spite of those laws there were so many attacks going on the medical person so there was a problem in the implementation of the law this is where the real uh, crucial thing lies who is going to implement how much to implement where will they implement there are 200 people there and uh, the police uh, etc will have to implement and they want to take a law and order situation to be created so that is there is a law that's very good we have been asking for the law for a long long time and it has come uh, probably under duress but even then it has come so now the implementation has to be looked into and that implementation has to be done properly you see doctors are being not allowed into go into their housing society they're not even being allowed to park their cars nurses are not we are thrown out of their rented places uh, all of this is going on and if a doctor has been identified you saw the social stigma that was there and there were people who are going around and saying what an irresponsible doctor he is he had uh, tested positive and yet he was still in this complex and all sorts of this happens and even their families are being uh, stigmatized they are being they are facing uh, social isolation this is a social thing Uh, that has to be. I, it cannot be. It it is forced. Okay, some people may be forced into uh, not uh, going into this uh, sort of uh, thing against uh, attacks against doctors. But there are many who are going to, you know, um, uh, take their chances. Another uh, thing that comes to mind, apart from the attacks, what is leading to the paranoia among common people is that even in our housing complexes, uh, we have elevators which is shared by uh, all flat. Uh, residents and uh, the spacing inside an elevator say a person inside an elevator if only three or four people get in you cannot even maintain half a feet of distance so that's correct that's it is a genuine concern uh, uh, the the fear stems from some genuine concerns uh, there is concern there is genuine concern if you have a somebody in the uh, being exposed to covid in the next flat Uh, and you are using the same elevators or the same uh, uh, places to park your cars etc yes. but there is a genuine but that concern is too much yes. it is not that and as for the uh, things that's a reason why masks have been made compulsory yes and if you have made the proper mask then you will not be spreading uh, the virus even if you are treating a covid patient and the care of all staff is not only doctors who are in the poor the nurses are there the nurses are the most important thing you see you see doctors they will go there so for 24 hours they will be there for an hour or maybe an hour and a half others nurses are there for the rest of the 20 hours 23 hours and all the para para medical staff will also be there so the care of all staff is important they all have to be taught how to use their uh, pp they all have to know how to dispose of the pp they all have to know wearing the pp how they are going to uh, behave themselves you see if you have a pp on ideally speaking you cannot even go into the bathroom for 6 hours or so whatever your duty period and there are uh, stories going on that uh, doctors are wearing uh, uh, adult diapers while wearing the pp so that they don't have to go to the bathroom because if they go to the is bathroom that a, is that a story or or a fact it's a fact it's a fact it's not it's a, a fact it is they are doing it in real not a story it's a fact now not all doctors do it but uh, there are some who have some problems uh, who have to do it and uh, the major uh, thing is that uh, so caring of the pp disposal of the pp knowing how to now, uh, i think the government is also looking towards recycling of pp and we've had similar uh, uh, concerns uh, expressed by the uk government since due to the lack of uh, being able to source uh, fresh pps they are asking now doctors and health workers and even hospitals to recycle and uh, sanitize uh, pps and then reuse them that had how, to come how realistic is or how uh, safe is the uh, is is this uh, demand by the government very difficult to say but you have to test the recycled stuff and see it is safe in matters of everything the quality of the stuff the quality of the stuff is preventing virus in uh, ingress uh, that has to be checked also when there is a lack of supply and increased demand there is a possibility that used masks and pps could be now uh, reused and sold to hospitals uh, claiming that they are sanitized and 
and RPP is really being tested now for uh, uh, those uh, criteria. The PPE that is now being used are ones that have been delivered, and I don't think the PPE is being recycled. It should not be. Uh, and that is that is what I'm saying. People who are looking out attending COVID positive patients. Because AIMS uh, has officially uh, produced a guideline. Uh, regarding the recycling and sanitizing of PPEs for reusage, there has been such a dearth of PPEs in this country. Yes, ultimately it will have to happen because the number of COVID patients are going to go higher. So that is it. But the main thing which I'm trying to say, those doing COVID duties, isolation duties are separate. Those who are doing uh, clinics are separate. So clinics, uh, you can... Uh, possibly recycle in the sense you wear a cloth thing uh, for your body and uh, that you can uh, recycle. But in terms of operative things, in terms of OT conditions, in terms of uh, or persons treating COVID patients, treating isolation patients, that has to be top grade. So with this, uh, let's go on to the next topic, the humanity and the socio-economic uh, impact and uh, food. Food is a huge problem. Government have now given rations. They're saying the six months rations are free, etc., etc. And the main thing is to see that it reaches the right place at the right time. And that is so very important because the food is the main thing. If people don't get food, especially uh, in the uh, majority of our persons who are uh, not so well off, who are in the really poverty category, if they don't get food, they're going to come out in the streets. If they come out in the streets and they don't get food, then they're going to go into a law and on a massive proposition. Jobs have gone, something has to be done for their jobs, a huge number of job cuts. And uh, the government has instructed the uh, private employers to uh, uh, pay the salaries for the next month or so, but that they uh, won't be able to do for long. Something has to be done about their jobs. So you either take a salary cut or else do uh, with the less person. So that's another huge, huge problem. I don't want to go into this because not really medical and more economics. Transport, I don't know when they're going to open it. And because once it's open, it's going to be another huge problem. The migrant workers have to return to home. How, when, that's another issue. A huge socioeconomic problem. The use of technology has to be improved. As you can see, the way we are talking to each other is a tremendous thing. We are doing an entire conversation for hours on end with uh, technology, which is uh, really saying something all the time. The children are learning uh, uh, through their uh, net. Uh, so, so many work at home techniques are being uh, done. Education uh, has also been gone on this. So the use of technology is going to improve. And I think in these cases, as far as we are concerned in the orthopedics, there'll be more of robotics, more of telemedicine, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty good. The one thing is sure, traditional life has ended. The way we were born up, brought up, the way we thought. And listen, looking at a cinema now seems so strange because uh, people are just crowding together and doing, uh, coming together and doing so many things, dancing together, eating together, etc. And you look at it and say, wow, this was what we were. But now in the final estimates in the years, in at least a year to come, uh, this is not going to happen. We are going to be separated. And next is the herd immunity. And that is the entire thing which we finish up with. Now, the herd immunity, or better still, uh, to call it population immunity, with herd immunity somehow implies that we are sort of animals. The virus runs out of susceptible victims because of isolation. So people are not, they're not transmitting from one to another because of quarantine or the immunity of the exposed person. If the exposed person is immune by itself, the virus can't get a hold of it. So you remove the possibility of sustained transmission. So to get to that point, the vast majority of people would need this immunity to develop. Now will you do a get immunity? Because you have to be exposed to the virus. Otherwise, you will not get immunity. So that's a logic behind, you know, uh, getting, uh, not staying at home and getting out and, you know, trying out this uh, immunity to the various persons. Like, uh, and then the vaccines. Herd immunity cannot be present without good vaccines. Unless the vaccines come, you cannot really think about uh, herd immunity. So immunity by vaccination, as we did in smallpox and measles, probably this will happen and uh, that's going to go down. But immunity by lifting lockdown, allowing persons to move about and work with precautions, you know, wear the mask, wear social distancing, wash your hands, etc., etc. 
but allowing persons to get infected and develop antibody. Now, this is a huge risk, huge, huge risk. Danger would be that the increase in number of infections and deaths. And the, if you increase the number of infections, you need more hospitals, more ventilators, more PPEs, more uh, uh, people to look at. And right now, we are struggling with even uh, uh, a very uh, limited uh, number of identified infected cases, and we are having a dearth of PPE and masks. So there's a very distinct and uh, possibility, a very realistic situation in which if, the, if the infection rates increase due to uh, herd immunity uh, procedures, then our hospitals and a healthcare system can completely break down and be overrun. Exactly. So it is a very, very calculated uh, risk which has to come about. The problems again with development of herd immunity is that for those who are, we are allowing people, to, we are allowing increase in number of infections so that people can get antibodies, right? Right. But we don't have a definite cure for the virus as yet. If you don't have a definite cure for an infection, how do you allow people to get more and more infected? That's the next thing is there's a second time infection. All this hard immunity is based on the fact, like smallpox and measles, that if you have an antibody, if you had the infection, you will not be infected again. Right. That is, second time infections are being seen in this, mainly due to mutations or mainly due to uh, the people not developing sufficient antibody. And the third is that asymptomatic patients, no test really available, and does positive test guarantee immunity? It's the same thing. A positive test, you see the patient recovers, but does that guarantee immunity? It does not. So this is another way. But again, herd immunity or population immunity is the only way we can get back to our own life. The only way we can mix with each other, the only way we can get to restaurants and the old fashioned way of having medicine, treating medicines, treating patients for us and for others, you know, uh, getting around, sitting around, chatting. Eat. In, in uh, 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 mass employed uh, uh, feet of, of, of human civilization, like farming, uh, like construction. Yes. So it's the only way to get back to old life would be by this immunity, by this population of herd immunity, whatever is there. So that is the whole issue here. So what does the future... It's possible if we have a vaccine in hand or, 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 or say an established method of treatment. You must need an established method of treatment. You must have a vaccine. You must, you, you, uh, not only that, you must have hospitalization facilities, good hospitalization, and it will help if you have a specific cure. Right. The future vaccine. Future is herd immunity or population immunity. The future is human lives. Many may have to be sacrificed while we attempt this herd immunity, etc. Telemedicine and robotics are going to come in as we discussed before. But the economically speaking, India will benefit. India will benefit because of the fact of its infrastructure. It has a huge workforce, huge educated English speaking workforce. China is going to be looked down after by the whole world. I'm not only talking about the lawsuits that have been done, et cetera, et cetera, but people are really mad that the Chinese gave it to the whole world. But, in that case, but is it, is it, uh, is it uh, established that uh, China, that the virus originated in China? Because there are now counter arguments and uh, as more science delves into the genomic uh, sequence of the virus and how it has mutated in people, uh, there are uh, two methods, there are two arguments now that, uh, uh, that the virus uh, did not originate in the Wuhan seafood market, that uh, because the initial tests showed that the majority of people that were infected never went to Wuhan seafood market and they had no contact with the persons who were infected from the Wuhan seafood market. Actually, I'm not going into how it happened because that's an issue which will be solved later. <coughs> and uh, to blame a country uh, which, uh, which uh, happened to face the initial brunt of a uh, virus, uh, which could be naturally created or lab, which got accidentally released, but 
Now every country now has bio warfare labs and every country is cutting down forests and exposing their population to newer and newer kinds of viruses. And it is just a matter of time before another virus uh, uh, comes and infects a different part of the world. Yeah, that's maybe right. But what I, in this case, what I am interested in, I will not go into the details of who did what and how that. But the major thing is that the whole thing started in China. And if it could have been contained in China, there would have been nothing better than that. But the Chinese workers did go to Italy. And, they, and you can see what the result is there. You need Chinese population is huge. They have been to the US and all that. And uh, once the thing has gone beyond China, to Europe and to the rest of the world, and the whole thing is messy. How how uh, crucial do you think uh, the role of the World Health Organization is in the spread of this virus? Did they warn the other countries on time? Uh, did uh, did they somehow uh, uh, look at the economic side of the fallout of this uh, virus spreading across the globe and decided that? Uh, it is best to prepare markets for collapse instead of suddenly shutting it down because what's happened in China. Did they have prior knowledge or did or did the Chinese government hide uh, something from WHO which resulted in a delayed response? Because WHO, even after thousands were dying in China, WHO didn't declare this virus as an epidemic or a pandemic. That came much later, the declaration. That did, uh, did. Uh, without going into this whole thing as to uh, how much uh, they did or what they didn't or what happened, I will go into this. There were certain uh, issues. WHO didn't know how to tackle this. This was not like any other infection. It was not like the flu or the uh, SARS virus, etc. Which it was not like that in in each, uh, exactly. They didn't know how to tackle it because I because of the asymptomatic nature of patients. Not only asymptomatic, they didn't know how to deal with it. They didn't know how the disease was spreading. They didn't know how the disease was acting. They didn't know how the disease would be transmitted. They were not at all very sure in Asian. I'll give you just one example. They were the ones who said masks are not important. They are the ones who are now saying that masks are important. It has to be done. You see, this sort of dilly-dallying within three months from the WHO is raises a grave doubt and what I'm saying, they didn't really know and they still are not very aware as to how to deal with this in a proper way. So, economy, as I was coming, India will benefit if there is a, a problem with China from the rest of the world. But then you must remember that all the nations are weak at this particular point of time. They're economically weak, their persons, their whole health system and all that attention is elsewhere. So this is, um, I, I may be very uh, scaremongering, but I think that this is the time in which uh, we also have to prepare for war. war because once hmm. war is economic war, and the other thing is real war, because if the economy shifts from one uh, country to another, the other, the other country is not to take, going to take it like that. Say, say for example, uh, Businesses in China, like what you're saying, like uh, they shift base from China to India. We are seeing at a prospect, uh, a possible prospect with a war with either Pakistan or China regarding this. War has many reasons, many things. So India will benefit from this, this I'm sure. But it may also face a war. Yes. If they can deal with the COVID possibly and uh, benefit and get out of it uh, with uh, relatively unscathed, but uh, if they do, uh, the economy is going to bounce back and India will benefit from the future world economic order. So that's it. It's a huge thing. I am very glad uh, uh, Mr. Kabir Kapoor uh, asked us to do this yes, because there are many this. problems which are many problematical uh, uh, as we discussed before. But so far, I think we've managed to give a reasonably uh, uh, decent uh, explanations of the historical way of how this happened, what needs to be done, what is being done, what should be done, and what the future holds. Thank you very much. Thank you.